Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining today's Facebook Live. As you probably know, kidney stones are a painful condition that affects many people. However, in some patients, these stones are so frequent and large that they can cause severe kidney damage. For some patients with frequent and severe kidney stones, the cause may be a rare disease called primary hyperoxaluria. Today, we'll be chatting with an expert in the treatment of primary hyperoxaluria, also known as PH, a mom of a child with PH, and a patient who did not have his PH appear until he was an adult. My name is Mike Spigler, and I'm the Vice President of Patient Services and Kidney Disease Education for the American Kidney Fund. For those of you who are new to us, the American Kidney Fund is the nation's leading nonprofit working on behalf of the 37 million Americans with kidney disease. Our mission is to fight kidney disease on all fronts to help those affected to live healthier lives. You can learn more about AKF by visiting us online at kidneyfund.org. We are presenting today's Facebook Live in partnership with the Oxalosis and Hyperoxaluria Foundation, a wonderful nonprofit that focuses on putting patients first. The OHF has supported thousands of healthcare professionals, patients, and their families through research, education, awareness, and advocacy. And their mission is to find treatments and a cure for all forms of hyperoxaluria. You can learn more about OHF at ohf.org. And today's event was made possible through a sponsorship from Onylum Pharmaceuticals. We are grateful for their support of our efforts to share this important education information about primary hyperoxaluria. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our guests. I'm excited to be joined by Dr. David Sass, a pediatric nephrologist from the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Amy Blake, a mom and caregiver extraordinaire to Ellen. And Billy Kramer, a patient with PH1 that suddenly turned severe as he was in the Thanks to all of you for joining me today. Thank you. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. And, and as you're watching this, please feel free to send in your questions and comments uh, and our team uh, will be uh, feeding those out into us to ask uh, our panelists today. So Dr. Sass, I'd like to start with you. Can you tell us uh, about primary hyperoxaluria? Sure, so primary hyperoxaluria is a genetic disease uh, in which uh, the patient has two abnormal genes related to oxalate metabolism. So oxalate is a, is a mineral that uh, typically we get from our diet, but the liver is also in charge of making it and metabolizing it. And so uh, normally the liver makes uh, uh, enough or a, a small amount of oxalate that is easily excreted by the kidneys. So the kidneys is like the main way that our body gets rid of oxalate, whether it comes from the liver or from the diet. And uh, when you have primary hyperoxaluria, there's a defect in one out of three uh, enzymes in the liver that creates an overabundance of oxalate. So it, it makes the liver produce so much oxalate that it can overwhelm the kidney's ability to excrete it. And so that oxalate ends up uh, combining usually with calcium and forming calcium oxalate kidney stones. So these kidney stones can be passed, uh, which is a painful event, uh, or and then they also, the, this calcium oxalate can get absorbed into the kidneys and calcify the kidneys and cause damage that way. If it becomes too overwhelming, uh, then the oxalate can also deposit in other tissues throughout the body. We call that systemic oxalosis. And that's one of the more feared complications of it. So it's inherited in what we call an autosomal recessive pattern. And that means that you need to have um, two bad genes, uh, typically one bad gene from mom and one bad gene from dad, and they uh, get together and cause the disease in the child. Um, so I'll, that's sort of just a basic overview. Um, do, do, tell me what, you, what more you want. Uh, uh, sure. I don't want to go too long. Sure, well, how many people have it, do we think? So the, it's really hard to pin down accurate numbers. Um, we estimate in the, it, there's a European study that estimated about one in 120,000 live births. Okay, so that means if out of 120,000 children that are born, one will have primary hyperoxaluria. However, um, and in, in the United States, there, there was a study out of Mayo a few years ago that using broader genetic, um, uh, data estimated that about one in 58 people are carriers of one gene, one abnormal gene, and about one in 38,000 people will have 
some form of primary hyperoxaluria. So that's part of the challenge, right? There are three types. There's pH 1, 2, and 3. And they're all caused by a different genetic defect, and they have varying degrees of severity. So while pH 1 tends to be the most severe, um, we, pH 3 is the least severe so far. And because it's the least severe, we suspect that there are actually a lot more people walking around with pH 3 than we know about because they don't present until later on, and they might be dismissed as having a regular old kidney stone disease when really they have primary hyperoxaluria type 3. So it's really hard to estimate the prevalence of it. That makes sense. And with so many people that don't know they have kidney disease just in general, I mean, if, if it's, you know, there's just a very uh, mild damage that's happening, it's, it's you know, to, to identify in the first place and then figure out what the cause is, is probably very difficult. Right, and so, and one of the big challenges specifically with pH, with uh, pH, so there are other rare kidney stone diseases um, that are genetic and inherited and, and severe, um, but sometimes those diseases form, you, those patients form stones that are very different. Um, and so they, as a clinician, you see this strange stone and you go, oh, this must be some rare genetic form of kidney stone disease. One of the challenges in primary hyperoxaluria is the type of stones you form, calcium oxalate, also happen to be the most common type of stone formed broadly. So there are tons and tons of people who form calcium oxalate stones. Most of them don't have pH, but some of them do. And the challenge is, okay, well, how do you distinguish the run-of-the-mill calcium oxalate stone former from someone who you should be suspicious might have pH? So, so how is that done? I mean, what's, what's the typical diagnosis and testing procedure for someone if, if they suspect uh, that they have uh, pH? Yeah, so I'm, I'm, a pro, I'm a pediatric nephrologist, so of course I have a bias um, in, in favor of how we do things in pediatrics. But so in pediatrics, if a child presents with kidney stones, the standard is to do a comprehensive evaluation, which includes a 24-hour urine collection. The 24-hour urine collection is crucial to identifying primary hyperoxaluria because in, on that 24-hour urine, in, in your run-of-the-mill calcium oxalate stone former, they probably have a normal oxalate excretion in their urine um, uh, compared to someone with pH where it's generally not just a little bit elevated, but very elevated. So that 24-hour urine can be crucial. And in pediatrics, we do a 24-hour urine or we should be doing a 24-hour urine on every sing single kid who presents with kidney stone disease. In the adult world, that is not standard. Unfortunately, we see too many patients where um, uh, they form stone after stone and no one has ever, uh, no doctor has ever said we need to do a 24 hour urine, which would have in all likelihood identified pH or at least, at least raise the suspicion for pH. So I think in the adult world, at the very least, our urologists and nephrologists should be saying anyone who's had, who has severe stone disease, meaning they have stones in both kidneys or they have a lot of stones or the stones are big anyone who sort of separates themselves out into a, a more severe um, uh, category should have a 24-hour urine collection done. I would advocate that, that all stone formers should because it gives you so much more useful information about how to prevent further stones, but um, that's not the current standard guideline. I, um, I tend to be a, a little bit overzealous about this, but I, you know, I like to do what's best for my patients. So, but, but at the very least, patient, adult patients who are having stones, who are having a more severe course of it, should definitely uh, be evaluated by uh, a true stone expert who will do a 24-hour urine collection. Is genetic testing a part of this as well, and, and can that help identify pH? Yeah, and so uh, genetic testing in kidney stone disease is a work in progress, um, as it is in many disease states, because it's becoming more available and cheaper, right? So it used to be, um, you know, literally millions of dollars to do genetic testing, and now it's gotten much uh, cheaper and faster and all of that. So in uh, at Mayo, we have a research protocol where we can uh, do genetic testing uh, for all of our stone formers. Um, most of us would agree that, that, that that's not necessarily um, uh, cost effective for every stone former. So usually what, we would, what I would say, my advice would be that, uh, again, if you have suspicion based on the clinical presentation, meaning that the sort of severity of the patient's disease, and then also results that you've gotten from testing. So whether it's a blood test abnormality or certain urinary findings, 
then you should pursue genetic testing. Absolutely. It's out there. It's available. So, you know, some, some companies are doing it for some commercial companies are doing it for free. You can do it for free through research protocols and or very often um, insurance companies will pay for it to be done uh, through a commercial lab. So it's available and it should be definitely on the radar screen of your um, of your stone expert physician. Great, and uh, I appreciate the comments that are coming in. I see Christy, who is a, a mother of two with PH. She said that uh, education is the most important uh, aspect of this and getting the word out, I guess, through programs like this. Would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. So the, you know, um, I see far too many kids who have had repeated stone episodes and, you know, a well-meaning urologist is um, just, you know, taking them to the OR and removing the stones, which is great, but no one has ever said, hey, why is this happening? And, uh, and, and that's really the crucial question. Why is this happening? And is there a way we can find out the answer? And yes, there is. You start with a proper evaluation and, um, uh, and go from there. And, and we, so we, you know, not every nephrologist is a stone expert. And so we, it's our job to educate the people who aren't stone experts to say, hey, these are the warning signs that you should be thinking about. And, and, and by all means, reach out to us. So we're all, um, I, I, well, I don't wanna speak for everybody, but we try to be very accessible to people. I get emails you know, every day from pediatric nephrologists who are experts in their own right in something else, mm -hmm. but want some help related to kidney stones. And we're always, the answer is always yes. I'm always happy to help and provide um, uh, advice when I can. And so educating people to know when to take the next step is very important. So two more questions, and I wanna to get to our, our patients and, and caregivers to talk about uh, kind of their experiences. But um, you'd mentioned that sometimes when it's so severe, you know, obviously it's affecting liver and the kidneys, uh, but there's other parts of the bodies. What, what are some other parts of the body that can be affected by pH? Um, pretty much all organ systems. So the ones that uh, have been studied uh, the best are the heart. So you can get uh, cardiac dysfunction or heart dysfunction from systemic oxalosis, you can get uh, neurological problems, skin problems, uh, eye problems. So we often get uh, uh, eye exams for our pH patients. So uh, pretty much all tissue types can be affected. Bone can also be affected. Okay. Well, what are the treatments for, for pH? So you've got the diagnosis, you've had the 24 urine test, you've got a definitive diagnosis. And I know for a lot of people, it takes some time to get that. Are there treatment options available? Yeah, so until November of 2020, there was not a single FDA approved um, treatment for pH, but that doesn't mean that there wasn't treatment. So the standard traditional treatment is uh, hyperhydration, meaning uh, okay. drinking lots and lots of water, which I'm sure uh, Amy and Bill will be able to tell you all about uh, the challenges with that. Uh, but so, so lots of water, and then we usually put patients on a medication uh, that we would classify as a crystal inhibitor. So before you get stones, you get crystals. And there are some medications that can help prevent crystal formation. And so the most common one that we would use is something called potassium citrate, which helps prevent that calcium and that oxalate from getting together and causing trouble. So hyperhydration, uh, crystal inhibitor like potassium citrate, some patients, some pH1 patients are responsive to a medication uh, commonly known as vitamin B6 or pyridoxine. So uh, we know that a subset of patients with pH1 are gonna respond very nicely to, to vitamin B6. So depending on the mutation, we will often do a trial of vitamin B6 on our newly diagnosed pH1 patients, and it only works in pH1. Um, uh, and, and see what the response is. So it, when it works, we continue it. If it doesn't, we stop giving it. Um, and, uh, but that's really about it up until the, this past November. So in November, we had a big breakthrough. Um, a clinical trial we were uh, helping to conduct uh, showed eff efficacy and safety of a medication called uh, Lumasiren or Lumasiran. Um, goes by the brand name Oxlumo, and that uh, medication has been, it's an injectable uh, subcutaneous injection, and that medication has been shown to decrease the amount of oxalate in the urine uh, by a very novel mechanism. It interferes with the way that the metabolic pathway that oxalate is produced in the liver in patients who have pH 1. That medication is only for pH 1, but um, again, it's new, 
Uh, but so far, the results are very promising. The, the publication should be coming out shortly where we um, you know, uh, show those results. Great. Thank you. Well, uh, I, w I see that Kim, uh, who's the executive director from the uh, Oxalosis and Hyperoxillary Foundation, uh, is in the, the chat as well. And Kim, thank you for being here, which is a great segue. I do want to, again, mention you can find lots more information on all three types of primary hyperoxillary and lots of other great information, too, on the OHA, OHF website, which is OHF.org. Uh, and, Again, and can I, let me just say one other thing. So, sure. so I'm glad I'm, I'm glad uh, you mentioned Kim because it reminds me. So, one of the keys in any rare disease space, um, and PH is a great example of this, being involved with the foundation. So, for us, it's OHF, and being involved in research registries is so critical. So, the the problem with rare disease, say, you know, how it's different from from a common disease like COVID or diabetes or hypertension. So in those more common diseases, you have millions of patients to, um, in which to conduct clinical research. And uh, in rare diseases like pH, you don't have those huge numbers. So in order to do any valuable research, you need to gather all of these patients together in one virtual space. So that's how OHF helps. And that's how at Mayo, we have the Rare Kidney Stone Consortium, and we gather all the data on these patients. And, and then the, so that's the flow in of data is how we develop clinical trials and how we develop new drugs and treatments. The flow out of OHF and the Rare Kidney Stone Consortium is how we disseminate information to patients. So it creates a place where patients can reach out to you know, our research coordinators or the OHF and say, hey, I'm, you know, my child has been diagnosed with primary hyperoxaluria. I don't know what this is. Help me get information. Help me connect to other families. Help me connect to doctors and experts who, who um, know what's going on and keep me informed of what's the latest and greatest in terms of research. So that is one of the most important things that we need to get out there is people need to connect and stay connected with OHF and uh, Rare Kidney Stone Consortium. You're, you're so right. And, you know, AKF has been partnering with, with not only OHF, but some of the other rare disease groups too. But that's really the key. We try to use our kind of broad reach and our wide umbrella to, to try to find patients and get information out. But then you're 100% you're right. It's, it's connecting it to these foundations that are in the trenches and dealing with these things. Uh, to and, really and, move it right. And, 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 the, and the beauty of OHF and RKSC is that the information that you would get as a patient or a parent is curated. Because, right. uh, you know, as, as opposed to, say, a, a just a random Facebook group that is just, um, you know, um, patients and interested people together, that's great. Like that, that provides a, a sounding board and all of that. But just know, like I've looked through those and there is a ton of terrible misinformation. And, um, and so I would caution anyone before acting on any of that information to go to OHF, go to your doctors, go to RKSC and um, get a, a you know, well-curated, evidence-based information. Great. Well, well, thanks again, Dr. Sass. I'm, I'll come back to you with some questions in just a little bit. If you are watching live, please join our conversation in the uh, comment section, send us your questions. Uh, it's being fed to me by my team, and we'll get those asked uh, of our panelists today. Again, today we're partnering with the Oxalosis and Hyperoxaluria Foundation. We're talking about primary hyperoxaluria, a rare disease that can affect multiple organs in your body, including the kidneys. So please, again, continue to send us your questions uh, throughout uh, this presentation. Uh, I want to first uh, now turn to our panel members who have lived through this. Um, and I'd like to start with you, Amy. Uh, can you tell us your story and what it was like fighting PH1 with your son, Owen? Sure. So um, Owen started presenting with symptoms about four days after birth. He um, had an arrhythmic heartbeat. Uh, that was actually caused by calcium depositing in his AV node. So just like Dr. Sass had said, where you have tissues that can be involved and damaged by having pH, Owen did have that um, issue immediately following birth that we were aware of. We didn't know that it was pH one at the time, but we would find out later. He struggled with failure to thrive, um, hypertension that was a result of kidney function, um, renal tubular acidosis, he has had many broken bones because he has very thin bones. His calcium deposits where we don't want it to and not where we want it to at times. Um, he's had to have a feeding tube. Um, the first stone that he truly passed that we were aware of, he was three years old. We ended up in the emergency room for it because he was not able to pass it on his own. 
Um, that's when we first started rounding actually with urology and um, nephrology. And we saw a physician there for quite some time. And then randomly one day he was out for an emergency visit with, for, with his family. And we saw another physician and he looked over Owen's chart and he said, I think I might know what your son has. And just like Dr. Sass brought up, he did a 24 hour urine catch and he did a blood test. He said, we should know within two weeks or so. And sure enough, within two weeks, he had called me while I was at work and Owen had PH1. So um, following our diagnosis of it, Owen has had issues with intracranial pressure because his soft spots fused too early from calcium, um, fusing them together. So he's had to have a cranial vault done. Um, while he was healing from that, we had a three by two centimeter stone, which is for just for reference about the size of an egg. It was sitting at the top of the top of his ureter that had to be replaced. Um, so we started rounding with the transplant team. Over the years, Owen has had a significant loss in kidney function. Uh, we're, we're at about 50% function today. We were just being registered um, for a liver transplant and potentially a liver and renal transplant when our physician enrolled us in a compassion plea with the Oxlumo or Lumisarin study. Um, Owen went from having five times the lethal limit of oxalate in his urine to normal levels on the drug. So we didn't have to get listed. We were very fortunate for that, for this drug to come out right when it did. Um, but it is a very trying um, process, especially to get diagnosed, as Dr. Sass brought up. When something is so rare, there aren't a lot of avenues to turn to. And it is really nice to have references like OHF to turn to and see what other parents are involved in and what different advocacy groups are out there for support as a parent and a caregiver. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and you know, by getting on things like the registry, when I think my team is going to share uh, the OHF registry link uh, in, in the window now, you'll see that coming up, um, you know, not only for, you know, patients that are just kind of getting into this, but even ones that, you know, if some other kind of presentation of this comes up down the time, I mean, you're not only helping others by getting more information out there, but you, you could even be helping yourself by getting in those registries. Absolutely. You learn a lot from the groups that are, you know, from OHF of what different clinical trial studies are out there and advocating for yourself and for your, you know, your whether it's you who has it or your child or whoever it may be, you know, to, to be actively involved in those sort of things so that you have better opportunities for treatment than just a transplant if you're in that type of situation. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we talked before the Facebook Live, and you told me, you know, that the, the amount of time it took to, to get that answer. It, it, it's great you met a doctor that kind of helped you find it, but I can't imagine what it was like going through all of that, and what it was like being a parent with a child going through this, and how to explain what was happening to Owen. Um, what was that like? What was that experience like of just not having those answers for for a bit? It was extremely trying. Owen was five when he finally got diagnosed. We spent approximately three years inpatient at our local children's hospital here at Pittsburgh on and off. We actually ended up in a um, children's home at one point to sort of see because he had so many different issues with failure to thrive um, that we couldn't get him to eat properly or gain weight properly. Um, it was, you know, just truly very challenging as a patient and a caregiver to go through it. Owen had numerous different genetic tests that we did from muscle biopsies to a thousand sticks and pricks. It is hard to explain to a child that you're trying to figure out what is happening. They don't understand. And sometimes you as a parent and a caregiver don't understand. You know, it becomes extremely frustrating and challenging. Yeah. And, and then when you had that answer, I mean, I assume it was, uh, how would you describe that? A, a relief? Uh... You know, how would you it was it? it was truly a relief. You know, you wait for that moment. But also, I will say, as a parent, it, when you first read about OHF during that time and the different options that were available to you for treatment, it could be sort of a punch in the gut to, oh, my goodness, my child's going to have to have a transplant. Oh, th this their life expectancy is going to be X, Y and Z, you know, and I would just say as a caregiver, allowing yourself to feel whatever it is you need to feel as you go through the process is probably the right process for you because you don't have to be ecstatic that, oh my gosh, I found the answer. Yes, I'm, I am very happy, but also, you know, 
it is okay to also sort of have that lackluster feeling as well. Yeah. Have you connected with other parents of, of other children with, with PHS through this process? PH, uh, through this process? I mean, I know it's a rare disease, but you know, through OHF or, or other ways? I have. So whenever I first got involved with the clinical trial study with Oxlumo, there is another parent in the area with a child that's actually the same age as my Owen wow. um, that, that I was able to connect with and her son, you know, and Owen. It's amazing how you may present differently at different times, but a lot of the stories align and, and the symptoms that they experience, you know, their timelines just might be different. Yeah. Well, thanks again for sharing your story, Amy. I'll come back with, as we get more questions in, um, I can't imagine what's going through all of that, but, but the congratulations for, for coming out um, on, on a good side of it. Um, so well, thanks again, everyone. If you're watching live, again, please join our conversation. Uh, we are partnering with the Oxalosis and Hyperoxaluria Foundation, and we're, again, talking about primary hyperoxaluria. Uh, I want to say that we are, again, very grateful also to our sponsor, All Nylon Pharmaceuticals, for helping to make today's program possible. Again, please continue to send us your comments and questions uh, during our Q&A, and uh, we'll uh, push the, these out to the audience and our panelists. Mm -hmm. So uh, as you heard from Dr. Sass earlier, pH can appear in both children or in adults. Uh, and you've heard Amy talk about her son Owen's experiences, but now we want to bring in Billy Kramer who had a much different experience as an adult. Uh, Billy, thanks for joining us today. Yeah, good to be here. Can you tell us uh, your story of living with pH one? Well, uh, yes, I sure can. Um, well, it all started, I was 44 years old, this all was about two and a half or so years ago, it was October of 18. Um, I got sick, I had my blood work done and uh, my creatinine level had elevated. So they sent me to the hospital, I had acute kidney failure. Um, while I was in the hospital there, um, my creatinine had, I was probably there for almost two weeks and it just never came back. So during that time, my nephrologist had done an oxalosis um, evaluation, like doctor said, a 24 hour, and they realized uh, that, yeah, I mean, my oxalate was very, very high. So after about two weeks, they sent me home because I, I wasn't having any symptoms or anything. I did have two very large stones, but they weren't affecting me at all. You know, I wasn't experiencing any pain. And I'd only had two kidney stones in the past. I had one when I was 16, which had to be removed at the hospital. They didn't really do anything about it. You know, they just told me to drink a lot of water and, uh, you know, stay hydrated. And then I maybe had one other kidney stone about 10 years ago, which I just passed naturally and didn't really think anything of it, you know, mm -hmm. a couple of kidney stones in my life. So anyway, I'm in the hospital for two weeks. They send me home and uh, I am in the process of getting this genetic testing because the nephrologist thought perhaps it is pH one. And I didn't get my results back for about four to six weeks, I don't think. But in the meantime, I did end up in end stage renal. So I was immediately put on dialysis. This was about a month after I, you know, got sick and went into the hospital. So, and I was having my blood work done every month because I had a heart condition. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it, it really happened fast for me. You know, my kidneys failed within a month. Um, so I was on dialysis. Um, and then I, when I got the results back, uh, I, you know, at the time there wasn't any, there was no fix except for a transplant. So I spent a year and a half or so on dialysis, spent a lot of time at the Mayo Clinic there. Uh, and uh, I finally got listed uh, this past, uh, I guess it was in March of this year. And I did finally receive my kidney and liver transplant in April. Congratulations. It happened very fast. It was amazing. But uh, it's amazing what this OHF thing is doing, that they have this medication now for people. So how are you doing now? I mean, you're, you're, how are you feeling? How's your oxalate levels now? Oh, my oxalate levels are perfect. I mean, I'm down to, I mean, they're, they're normal. I mean, I'm totally fine. Right. Creatinine levels have been great. Um, 
I haven't had any problems. Uh, low energy, that's about it. <laughs> but that must, um, been, that must have been something, you know, getting your, your kidney and liver transplant, you know, it, I, I don't know when really we say the height of the pandemic is anymore, um, but certainly in the early stages of it when there was a lot unknown about it. I mean, you know, there were a lot of transplants that are not even happening. So what was it like getting that, that transplant, you know, during that time period of, of COVID-19? Well, I really didn't have a choice. I mean, time was of the essence in my case. Um, you know, I was being given the gift of life, you know, so I, but yes, it was not an easy time. You know, it's like, oh, so we got COVID and I'm getting a transplant, you know, uh, but it was okay. You know, everything went fine. In fact, it, you know, being on the anti-rejection medication and everything, I have to be very safe anyway. So, um, yeah, it's kind of, it's kind of been helpful actually. Yeah. So uh, how long was it from when you kind of had your first, uh, inclination that you had a problem until you got your pH uh, one diagnosis? Well, when I, when I got sick, it was in October of 2018, went into the hospital, you know, after I found out that my creatinine level was high, and like I said, uh, I had gotten the genetic testing done about two weeks after, you know, the doctor told me, you know, this could be pH one, you know, you have a very high oxalate level. And uh, it took about a week or so of doing some research to, to get an affordable genetic test, to be honest. And, um, but we did and found out about four weeks later. So, I mean, I found out maybe six weeks after I, I was hospitalized with acute kidney failure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So at the, let me do, if you don't mind, I would just like oh. to point out. So, so the the there are different ways to look at it, right? This the the um, one of the things we always talk about is the um, delay in diagnosis of pH. So un unfortunately, Bill's story is pretty common that there the lag between the onset of symptoms related to pH and the diagnosis on average is about eight years. Okay, which is that's a, a, a long time. And for Bill, unfortunately, it was even longer. You can, you know, obviously you never want to you never want to play Monday morning quarterback and, and all of that. But you, you, I'm sure, Bill, you think, gosh, what if, you know, what if I, when I had that first stone, someone had said, let's do a 24 hour urine. It, it I might agree. Be a, a very different path for you. Now, that's completely speculative. You might have ended up uh, just where you ended up the same way. Um, but the the it, it's a, a, a unfortunate for Bill, but a great illustration for us to learn from about the importance of doctors having this on their minds and, and, and uh, you know, taking a, a, going the extra mile for your patients so that you don't miss uh, diagnoses like these. Um, so, you know, again, obviously I'm biased and this is near and dear to my heart, but, uh, the, you know, the other, and the other aspect of not missing disease is family screening. So, uh, we're, we're big proponents of screening family members. Once you identify someone in your family has pH, screening the other family members. So we published a study uh, a year or two ago showing that patients who are diagnosed with pH through family screening, meaning not through the usual, I, I have a bunch of kidney stones and I'm showing up to the ER, not through the, the normal clinical pathway, but because they were screened because of a family member, their disease is just as severe as those who were diagnosed through the clinical pathway. So meaning, so, you know, the, the difference is just in who passes a stone, right? So when it comes to pH and any stone disease, the clinical presentation is the passage of stones, but passage of stones does not necessarily reflect the severity of disease, right? So, um, uh, you, you know, uh, Amy's son, Owen, was not passing stones but his kidneys were being actively damaged while this process was going on. And probably the, the same for Bill. He passed one stone when he was 16, but just because he wasn't passing stones doesn't mean his kidneys weren't taking damage from the pH. So um, we're, we're really big advocates to say, if, if you have someone in the family who's been diagnosed with pH, they sh you should go through some screening process. I mean, the gold standard would be genetic testing, but even short of that, um, the next best thing would be a 24 hour urine. And then the next test, best thing before that would be just an ultrasound. Just look at the kidney, see if there are any stones in there. The absence of stones does not say does not say, oh, you definitely don't have pH, but at least it's a it's a a uh, relatively cheap and easy screening tool that's non invasive. But really, a twenty four hour urine is better, and genetic testing is even better than that. 
Dr. Sass, what family members should be tested? I mean, is it is it, you know, siblings, children, parents, like who should be tested? So I would say what we would call first degree relatives, meaning, um, uh, you know, those who would be in the household with you. So uh, uh, parents, siblings or children. OK. And, and you know, Billy, we've we had a conversation before this. I, I know you have siblings. How many siblings did you say you had? I have six. Six. Yeah. And, and I know you've you've kind of struggled with that conversation with them. Have you have you had the conversation about getting screened? Oh, yeah. Many a time. Yeah. And to be honest, none of them have been tested. Yeah. Yeah. And well, that's not I think uncommon. we're just afraid to know. Yeah. You know? And, and that's that's not uncommon. Um, that's not, a, you know, I, it's I would I would say it's uncommon for all six to have said no. Usually it's a mixed bag with family members. Um, and, you know, because and, and that's fine. Like, I get that. Some people uh, don't want to know. However, the big the, that that's fine. Six months ago. Now that there's an actual treatment for it, then I I say, boy, it's tough to to me it, because there's a treatment. It makes it tough to. Uh, this is what I've been telling them. I'm like, you do not want to go through kidney failure. You do not want to have a double transplant. I mean, it's no fun. Yeah. <laughs> it's, you know, uh, we are working on a on a document. I talked to your family guide that we're working on in conjunction with with OHF um, uh, that we're putting together. We're going to have that up soon. Uh, if you'd like information on how to get that later, you can send us an email at education at kidneyfund.org. And when that's out, we'll make sure uh, that we uh, get that uh, out to you. Um, Dr. Sasa, I've got a question from the audience, but I'm going to selfishly ask one of my own first really quickly. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, you heard Amy, right, with with her son doing having this and, um, you know, Billy as a, maybe 16, maybe earlier, but as an adult where it really kind of presented itself. Why do we see such a variation in presentation between um, different people? Yeah, so there is a huge variation in the severity of all three types of, of pH. You know, we can we can broadly classify them as, you know, which is the most severe, and which is the least severe, but the truth is there's a, a big spectrum of, of disease. And so some kids, I mean, and you're seeing it right in front of you, right? So Owen, you know, essentially presented at four days of life and about as early as you can and, uh, for, for Bill, it was much later when he presented uh, with more severe disease. So there, we have not yet been able to really show a strong, uh, what we call genotype-phenotype correlation. So genotype means your genetics. Phenotype means how those genes present, or how the disease presents in real life. And so with, with the goal is you would love to be able to do genetic testing see what the actual details of the genetic abnormalities are and say, aha, based on these genetic results, we can predict that you're going to have a mild course or you're going to have a moderate course or you're going to have a severe course because then that can inform how aggressive you're going to be with treatment. Unfortunately, even though we've looked at it, um, we've not been able to find a really nice tight correlation. So it's really just speculation at this point. And, and so, so what that means is the key is that every patient needs to be treated like an individual and monitored carefully. So you, you wanna watch the trajectory of the stone burden, of the uh, blood work like uh, creatinine, which measures, which helps you determine kidney function and the urinary, uh, urinary oxalate excretion as well. So we don't have a great way to predict severity. We, there are probably d disease modifying genes, meaning genes outside of the ones we know about pH but that impact the course. So there's still a lot to learn. And, and again, another plug for your, you know, your research uh, registries. The way we make progress here is by you know, gathering groups of patients, doing studies on their genetics and following their course over time. And, and that over, uh, over time will help us, uh, if we investigate it properly, will help us predict these things. And, and by the way, while I'm thinking of it, I should have done this at the very beginning, but I want our audience to know, you should always know, you know, um, uh, we do something in we do uh, something in medicine called disclosures or uh, um, uh, conflicts of interest. So you should always know when you're listening to someone to speak where they're uh, coming from and if there's if they have a financial incentive to say what they're saying. So I just want to get out of the way that um, while Al Nilam, the maker of Gumasaran, has um, uh, given funding for the trials that we do and and money has gone to Mayo Clinic for me to participate in these clinical trials and, and help with these things and, and, and help with education, I personally do not see a dime of that. 
So yes, Al Nylum has funded some of this uh, to, to allow Mayo to allow me to do this. None of this actually goes uh, into my pocket. So I believe you know, no one is ever truly unbiased, but I uh, like to believe my opinions are pure. <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, so, Dr. Sass, this was, uh, I want to get some of the questions from the audience, and then I've, I've uh, got some others coming in as well. The question is, can family members donate a kidney to a close family member whose kidneys failed due to pH? So, can family members donate one of the, okay, yeah, so so the, the uh, process for seeing who is an eligible donor doesn't change with pH. So, that donor, just like any other potential donor, would go through a screening process that would look for things like kidney function, kidney stones, they might not necessarily check a 24 hour urine to look for oxalate. They might, at some centers, they might. Um, but the, so no, being a sibling of someone does not disqualify you automatically, but you would go through the same rigorous process uh, as any potential donor. Great. Uh, another question from the audience, are there any natural treatments? Well, water's about as natural as you can get, right? Um, so, so yes, but beyond that, uh, no, there is no um, uh, known, you know, supplement or herbal kind of thing that has been shown to be helpful. Um, although, I'll take this opportunity. The, the, the one thing out there that is being studied actively is a bacteria called Oxalobacter formigenes. So, interestingly. Oxalobacter formigenes is a bacteria that's found normally in, in most healthy people's gut. And it's a bacteria that literally eats oxalate, right? That's how it gets energy. And uh, so there have been studies going on actually for years now, trying to figure out a way to use, to harness the power of that natural bacteria to um, lower oxalate levels in humans. So those trials are ongoing and uh, we'll see where that goes. Um, and while we're talking about novel treatments, there is there are there are clinical trials going on right now for another uh, medication that uses a similar mechanism to uh, lumisiran, except it would be uh, the theory is that we will be able to use it for all three types of pH. So there's a clinical trial going on for that, and then finally there are clinical trials going on for a um, um, an enzyme replacement, essentially. So uh, that breaks down a medication that actually breaks down oxalate using a special enzyme. So there are other things that are in the works. And so the, if the future looks bright, I, I'm hopeful that, that some of these will come, come through as viable treatment options. And perhaps, you know, the, the, the holy grail will be being able to use them in combination uh, to, to maximum effect. But, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. We have lots of, of clinical trials and research to do before we get there. Right. Thank you very much. I mean, you know, AKF has lots of information on clinical trials in general. If you just want to get familiar with what that process looks like, and OHF has lots of information on these particular trials uh, that are going on on their website too. I want to switch gears a little bit and just talk about for for Amy uh, and Billy. You know, anytime you're dealing with a chronic disease, it, it it's not just a physical toll. It's a mental toll. It's an emotional toll. Um, I'll start with you, Amy. For for Owen, I mean, you know, what was it like him just trying to be a kid, you know, in the process of, of dealing with, with a chronic condition like this? So it's hard to be normal, right? Because um, you want to treat them as if they're normal. But with Owen, he ended up having a pacemaker and he had, have, you know, different neurological surgeries and things like that. So it is um, first and foremost as a caretaker really important. And it sounds cliche to take care of yourself. There's no wrong or right way to feel about the process that you're going through. Sometimes you have to take things second by second, day by day, what, however that process may be, because in order to be able to truly provide stability for your child in my situation, um, you have to be able to um, speak candidly, allow them to express their feelings and concerns about what's going on, so I know Owen has had great fears about, you know, death and surgeries and just the different procedures that you have to go through. So it's really important that you have open lines of communication, that you are taking care of yourself and allowing yourself to just go through the process naturally and not trying to force things to fit in little boxes because unfortunately with PH1, it's hard to fit little, little boxes like Dr. Sass said because there is no regimented course that this takes with every single patient that you know what the next thing that's going to be coming for you looks like. 
It literally is an individual case by case basis where, you know, we didn't have nephrocalicinosis until the very end here, where some patients present with that before they ever even have a stone. So you don't know what's coming for you and just allowing yourself to go through the motions naturally, I think would be my, my biggest coping mechanism. Great, thanks. Billy, how about you? What was it like, you know, living through a chronic condition? I know being on dialysis is tough for anybody. Oh, but everything else you had going on too, what, what advice do you have for others going through that? I mean, it's, I don't even know where to start. I mean, you just, you gotta have a will to live. I mean, you really do. Um, you know, I had a heart surgery a year before my kidneys failed. I had to have another heart surgery during my workup for transplant. Um, you know, it just, it just seemed like things were just getting worse and worse and worse. You know, while I was waiting just to get on a list, you know, I'm like, when am I going to be healthy enough to finally be transplantable, you know? Um, so it was very frustrating, you know? I mean, there were points where I didn't know if I was going to make it. Um, but, you know, it, it, you just have to stay positive. You have to keep up with your treatments. You have to do what the doctors tell you to do, you know? I mean, I had to go to dialysis four times a week for four hours at a time because of the concentration of oxalate in my system. Um, you know, I was getting my oxalate levels tested every two weeks. You know, they were monitoring it very, very closely. And um, so that was a little encouraging. You know, the dialysis was helping. I was half responsive to B6. So um, that was encouraging. I actually, my oxalate levels were actually getting better as I was moving along. Um, so I wasn't thinking I was, you know, going to die right away. Um, because I know time of what is of the essence with this disease. I mean, in my case, it definitely was. Um, but it, it, I can't tell you, it's just, you gotta be strong and you, it, it helps to have strong people around you and with you. I mean, I, I couldn't imagine doing this alone without having a, that's a true. Course. You know, my wife is been a rock. You know, having good friends helps, and just it's it's amazing. You know, other people made me want to be a lot. It takes <laughs> um, a village. It does. It does, and they have to be strong too. I mean, you know, this wasn't easy. You know, my life changed dramatically once I started the house. You know, I, I wasn't able to work like I was. I, you know, I wasn't providing for my family like I was, you know, just so many different things changed. Physically, I wasn't able to do half the things I was able to do before. Um, so it's just a huge game changer, but your, your attitude just has to stay positive. You have to have a strong will. And, I mean, life is just too precious. I don't know what else to say. Well, and, and I want to say, you know, that the, the, the the courage that I see in my patients is astonishing and in the families. And I, I wanna drive home the point that the patients and their families are the heroes here. You know, this breakthrough medication that we have is really, was really catalyzed um, by, by parents and patients. So, you know, people have been doing research in pH for years and it's really hard to do um, top level research in rare diseases because, um, without getting too far into the weeds, the FDA requires ha certain things for you to do these trials. And in, in a rare disease space, you often can't meet those criteria. So you end up not being able to do the breakthrough research you need, even though we were trying and trying and trying. And it wasn't until a few years ago where some parents got together and said, we need to change this. We need to team up and do it. And, they, and we joined forces. So the scientists and the researchers and the physicians and the parents all got together and went to the FDA and said, this has to change. And it, it took a while. It was a process for sure, but it was the, the parents is, and, the, and the patients is what made us turn the corner. And that's why we have this breakthrough uh, drug today was, was really because the, you know, they came through and stepped up as heroes. And um, I'll, I'll never forget that. And I'll just piggyback off of that. If we didn't have resources like Julie and, and, uh, you know, OHF as an organization and Kim to help us know which direction to go to and being able to leverage and advocate for ourselves. 
things like this wouldn't take off. It just goes to the point of, you know, it is really important to have some type of group like that that can help move things along and sh give us a little bit of progression in that area as patients and caregivers for support. Yeah, so I would say, you know, as patients and families ask questions, um, you know, don't be afraid, it's your right. Um, uh, ask questions and if you are if you feel like your doctor is, you know, not really sure or says, boy, I've, I've, I've only seen one patient with this, then say, well, maybe, you know, uh, how do you feel about reaching out to an expert, you know? And, because uh, everyone knows, we all, you know, go to the meetings, we know who are the experts in different things. I reach out to, to, to experts in different fields uh, when I have patients with a condition that maybe I'm not as familiar with. So um, don't let egos get in the way of the quality of your care. Okay. Well, thank you guys very much for carrying the conversation while I uh, dropped out there for just a second. I appreciate it. Um, so we've got time for uh, just a, a few more questions. Um, and I see, uh, you know, if there's anything like, what is like the one takeaway? I'll go around and, and Amy, I'll start with you. The one thing you want the audience to take away from this uh, about your experience in PH. That there's always hope in, in anything, even if you do have some rare disease that you're not sure what place to go to. I mean, if you had asked me five years ago, if I'd be here today, seven years later in the same space, um, I would have told you I have no clue. I, you know, but if you carry the torch and the hope and the mindset that there can be change that happens within the disease that you may have, it, it can and it will happen if you are a, an engine for change. Great, thank you, Billy. How about you? Yeah, I, I, I just reiterate exactly what you said. I mean, th there is a light at the end of this tunnel um, if 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 you see it through. Um, you know, I'm just so happy to see that there's a medication out there now for these people. You know, this is not an easy disease to deal with. Um, and I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. Um, you, 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 just it, it just amazes me that there is something that can be done without having a liver transplant. Um, you know, that was not available for me. So I just think it's wonderful to see these groups these doctors, all this research going on to help these families that are suffering with this disease. It's a it's a beautiful thing and I'm just so happy for for everyone that's involved. And I'm very glad to be part of it. And just everyone out there who is affected by this disease, stay strong. You know, there there is a light at the end of this tunnel. There really is. Thank you, Billy. Dr. Yeah. Sass, how about you? Any final words? Sure. Well, I want to thank uh, Amy and Billy for sharing their stories and uh, for enduring this. Um, and yeah, I would say I, I would I would really uh, ask everyone to support science and support politicians who vote for science, because that's the only way this stuff gets done is through funding. I mean, you've seen what is possible when we put resources towards science with the development of this astonishing COVID vaccine that I, I got uh, dose one in my left arm, dose two is coming in a week or so. That's what happens when we uh, put resources towards science and the drugs that are coming out for pH, that's what happens when we're able to put resources towards science. So, you know, really, um, uh, I would say, you know, support science and believe in science and be careful of uh, you know where you get misinformation. Go to trusted sources. Great. Well, thank you. So, Dr. Sass, Amy, Billy, thank you again for spending this time with us this afternoon and providing some great advice. You can learn much more about all three types of primary hyperoxaluria on the AKF website at kidneyfund.org, but especially through the OHF website at ohf.org. Another good resource to learn specifically about primary hyperoxaluria type one, PH one is El Nylum's informational website, which is aboutph1.com. Uh, uh, thanks to everyone uh, for at home for joining in too. Uh, we'll be sharing new PH1 resources from AKF in the coming months. If you aren't already, follow us on Facebook or send us your email at education at kidneyfund.org and you'll be the first to know when they're released. Uh, again, and you can also connect with us at education at kidneyfund.org uh, to get that information also. Finally, I want to thank once more our sponsor, All Nylon Pharmaceuticals, for their support of today's broadcast. Thanks, everyone, and have a great day. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye.